Hi, welcome to the Myelin Institute at Queen Mary University of London and welcome to another video by my friend and colleague Professor Sophie Harmon of the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary. In this video, Sophie is going to be discussing the interaction of gender inequality and the COVID-19 crisis. She's going to be looking at the extent to which the crisis will affect not only women's health, but also their personal and indeed their economic security. If you enjoy the video, please do share and please come back for more. Hello, my name is Sophie Harmon. I'm a professor of international politics at Queen Mary University of London, where I specialise in global health politics. By now, you must be familiar with the phrase that viruses don't discriminate. We are all susceptible to COVID-19. However, whilst viruses don't discriminate, they do exist in societies that do discriminate. As Louis Pasteur just said, the microbe is nothing, the terrain is everything. Now, I don't think he was talking about gender when he said this, but this phrase can very much apply to the gendered nature of pandemics. So why are pandemics gendered? Well, they're gendered in terms of vulnerability, and secondary effects of the pandemic. So the first issue is how gender shapes susceptibility or vulnerability to infection. So we know from years of research on HIV and AIDS that gender norms really affect the reason why majority of people living with HIV in the world are women. And this is because of their roles in society, family, economic wealth, that kind of intermesh in a complex way that leads to their susceptibility. Now, COVID-19 is sort of bucking the trend in that it's actually gender norms that may be leading to an increase of susceptibility for men. So as any good feminist will tell you, of course, gender norms affect men just as much as they affect women. That's why we're talking about gender and global health here rather than women in global health. Now, the research on COVID-19 and the disproportional effects on men is actually quite early in its uh, research stages. So just to bear that in mind. But we're seeing some of the implications of this being explained by uh, men's respiratory systems, as maybe they're different to women's in some way, but also social gender norms around men's risky behaviour be that smoking, drinking, access to health services and how they perceive their own health and well-being and take responsibility for it. So this is something we're going to see unpacked and researched further. The one thing though that does make women more vulnerable than men to pandemics is that women make up the majority of the health and care workforce around the world. So when we talk about frontline healthcare workers, when we think about concerns around frontline healthcare workers, we're talking about women. Then there is the secondary health effects on women. So we know that pandemics can have secondary health effects on pregnant women. So if you talk to anyone involved in pandemic preparedness and you ask about women or gender, they'll tend to talk about pregnant women and if pregnant women are at risk to the virus. Now, the good news in COVID-19 is that's not the case. The risk, however, becomes when a pregnant woman may be nervous about seeking care or health care for her pregnancy during her pregnancy. Now, who would want to be pregnant right now? I, my heart goes out to pregnant people right now. You don't have anything to fear, but it's natural for you to worry at this stage, even though you have nothing to worry about. But this is part of the problem. And we saw this with the Ebola outbreak in 2014-16, where maternal mortality rates, particularly in um, Sierra Leone, went up as a consequence of women not wanting to deliver in health centres. Now that's devastating, and it could lead to more deaths in some cases than the virus itself. So with self-isolation in the home, the most obvious issue is that the home is not a safe place for everyone. And this can therefore lead to women and men being more susceptible to domestic abuse and violence. And unfortunately, this is a trend that we're beginning to see play out within COVID-19 with really serious implications for both women's well-being, their lives, and also the wider care structure that is in place to support those women. The other issue you have with healthcare is related to women's access to reproductive health services, be that safe abortion on one end of the spectrum, 
to contraception access, to HRT as well. Now this has been a problem increasingly in the UK, but it's now going to be exacerbated potentially by the crisis. Finally, the other effects you have are women's role within the economy. So within the informal sector, within self-employed sector, and also their just ability to do work whilst isolating from home and looking after the kids. So we've long talked about the double shift that women put in. So working women, so you go to work, you come back, you do another job by looking after the house. This is now becoming the triple shift because you're doing your work, you're keeping the kind of you know, domestic chores and you're also teaching your children. Now, before every man comes at me, I imagine there's a lot of men doing the teaching and pulling up, picking up the slack in this way. However, statistically, we know that this is probably going to fall on the women. Now, we've known all these issues around pandemics for years. Those people who work in gender and global health have been shouting this from the rooftops. Some of us even made a film about it to try and get wider attention around the gendered, out, around the gendered aspects of health and disease. But nothing really happened. No one was really talking about it. No one's talked about it with Ebola, Zika, a little bit more around AIDS, but not so much. And this is the kind of gets explained away that, well, there's not that many female leaders in global health. So if you had more women that were in leadership positions, this would create better outcomes. Not necessarily. Lack of gender expertise or people listening to the gender experts, which is a secondary issue there. And that really pandemic preparedness tends to always focus on the virus itself rather than the secondary effects. It's a very kind of health clinician kind of focus rather than these wider social issues. And often just these global health institutions struggle to really comprehend gender. But substantively, and this is something that I've really been thinking about over the last couple of weeks, is that gender issues follow the wider problem of global health security in that these issues don't become pertinent until they start to affect people in the global north or the west. So people are talking about gender issues and women's issues in regard to COVID-19 and previous epidemics because it's starting to affect their lives and we're starting to see it. Now, this is slightly depressing, but not because it's good. It's good to have this conversation. If this is an opportunity, that's great. But it does point to a wider issue that not all women's lives are equal. They're not equal in terms of how we regard women's lives and their bodies between women living in the global south and the global north, low income countries, high income countries, but also within those states themselves. So, for example, this week, when I heard about the really unfortunate death of Kyla Williams, because she was not seen as a priority when she called for help with regard to what she thought were COVID-19 symptoms that turned out to be COVID-19 is this horrible statistic that we have that black women are five times more likely to die from pregnancy related issues than white women in the UK. Just let that sink in. This is a whole issue of racial discrimination that we have in the UK as well. And of course, it's not just race. It's race, trans issues, class issues, all intersect to affect women's lives, which makes us think about which women's lives matter. What strikes me now around some of the conversations we're having around COVID-19 and gender is that we've got these issues on the table. What we now need to do is notice that not all women are the same. And some women are going to be so much more susceptible to these issues, both vulnerability and the secondary health impacts than others. And therefore, we should see this really as a building block to make global health security work for all women.